Okay, so we have a prep table here. This is six drawer with a cold rail. It's not working on the bottom. Okay, so one of the first things I'm gonna do is put my thermometers in it. But before I do that, I'm gonna calibrate it. Ice water should be reading 32 degrees. This is the Fluke 52.2. This is great because you can calibrate it without taking the panels off. Love this guy. Very important though that you pay attention. The thermal couples have to stay. That's why they're labeled. They have, they're calibrated for that terminal now. And you can't switch these thermal couples to another thermometer without recalibrating them. There we go. So now we're going to use them to verify the box temp. Okay. So I have two probes in there in the return of each coil. 55, 56 degrees evenly inside the box. And right off the bat, I do not feel a lot of heat blowing out of the condenser. So I'm gonna make a guess and say that we're low on refrigerant because I'm not basically rejecting any heat. Suction line's lukewarm. Discharge line's hot, but... So at this point we need to apply service gauges to the system. Okay, so... Seventy-six degree liquid saturation temperature. Seventy-seven degree ambient. The rule of thumb on this guy is about 25 degrees above ambient, 25 to 30 degrees above ambient. Obviously the right way to do it is to weigh the charge in, but if you're in the field and you need to field charge it without weighing it in, you could start with about 25 above ambient, 30-ish, somewhere in there. That'll get you in the ballpark. Um, so that's where we're going to start. I'm going to add some refrigerant. I definitely know that we're low. Once I get it to where I think it needs to be, and the system is coming down to temperature, we'll uh, go ahead and leak check the system and then figure out where the leak is at. We're within ballpark now. The box is coming right down to temp now too. Once it got the right amount of refrigerant in it, it started kicking butt. So we're gonna wait for it to satisfy and pump down. Okay. I don't like this. I don't know if this is just a fluke or if this is a problem because the 34 degrees is the left coil, 37 degrees is the right coil, and that's return air. They should be pretty much identical. So I'm gonna have to make sure that both of those coils are actually working properly and we don't have a bad TXV on one of them. So it looks like we've got a multiple issue here. So we'll see. Still waiting for it to satisfy. The interesting thing is, is there's only a temperature controller in the right coil, the one that's at 37 degrees. Huh. So, I was gonna pump this unit down by letting it satisfy, and then bypassing the low pressure control so that the system would pull into a vacuum, but I couldn't, because I started thinking about something. This thing has a refrigerant leak in it. More than likely, it's on the low side of the system in the evaporator coils. If I'd have pumped it into a vacuum, we potentially could have pulled moisture or air into the system when I did that. So what I did was I just ran it as low as I could to about one PSI, then let the pressure control go, or I was just bypassing it by hand, um, then looked at the suction line or suction pressures to see if they rose really fast to indicate that we had a weak suction valve. Um, that's a very crude way of testing a compressor suction valve. Uh, most manufacturers actually say you can't do it that way anymore. I still do. On a semi-hermetic, it works perfect. On reciprocating uh, hermetic compressors, you know, you do have to be careful because you can't just condemn it just because it rises a little bit. But you'll be able to tell if you haven't come across one yet, you'll know when you come across a bad suction valve because when you pump it to negative or damn near negative and let it go, basically let the pressure control go, if you had a, a very bad suction valve, you'd be able to grab your suction line right there and it would be red hot because the discharge gas would be bypassing inside. The warm discharge gas that was just from a compressor that was just running would bypass the inside of the valves and come out here. So essentially that's what I was just checking. Um, so at this point now, it looks okay. 
I'm going to uh, go ahead and pull the coils apart and look for a refrigerant leak. Decided to wait to see what the temperature, this co these uh, temperature controller turns back on at. But while I was doing that, I noticed this. See how this is missing? That's a uh, sharp stainless steel. So I'll bring that up to the customer too, because someone could cut their hands. We'll look at all of them. That way when we give them a quote to repair wherever this leak is, we can give them a big picture on how bad everything is in the box. And so we're going to clean, or not clean, we're going to add cleaning on the mine because of this. The way these boxes are manufactured, it's almost impossible for the customer to be able to get in here without taking the box apart themselves. It's kind of ridiculous. It's nasty though. Um, but I'm going to pull these coils apart and look for leaks in both of them. Um, I mean, they're really bad shape. This drain pan's busted and falling down. So I have a feeling, we'll pull it apart right now, but I have a feeling it's going to be two new coils for this guy. But once I get it apart, so check this out. I couldn't find a leak. So I equalized the high side and the low side pressures. It's pissing out of there now. It's leaking in that coil all over the place. Look at that, man. That shit is just pissing out of the coil. That's bad. Let's see if I can... Maybe it's coming from the TXV. It looks like it's coming from the coil, though. I'll get in there a little bit and see what I can do, but it doesn't look like I could do much. I'm going to use a leak detector fluid. I really like the big blue. I like it in the spray bottle. You can put on the slight stream and it really picks up the leaks very well. It's probably my favorite leak detector. They do make other kinds, and I mean, they work, but I, I have better luck with this one. Getting the micro leaks, for sure. This guy is pissing out on the power head. So this whole coil is trashed. Look all the way in there. But what I'm gonna do for now, because by the time I get this approved and get this coil replaced, it'll be about a week or two. And uh, they need this box. They can't go without a week. This is their main region. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, pump it down real quick, change the power head on this guy. Put a power head on there temporarily, get them operational, and then we'll come back. You actually look right here. I love that big blue. It's actually showing micro leaks, but um, yeah, that that big blue is is amazing. It really does show you all your problems. And see, the cool thing about it is, like normal leak detector fluid, it doesn't show that guy yet. See, it's not bubbling, but you let it sit on there for ten minutes, and you come back, and it'll show all the micro bubbles. That's the the secret of big blue stuff is awesome. And I've tried the other brands that the supply houses carry. Everybody has like a knockoff. But there's something about the big blue that just seems to work better for some reason. So give it a minute. See, it's not even showing up yet. So any other fluid, it would take a minute. Or it wouldn't even show it, you know? And I'll be honest with you, my electronic leak detector didn't even pick that up either. And I have a really good, I trust it very well, it's the DTEC Select. It does a great job, but the big blue will show leaks that that thing won't show. I know you guys will tell me to get the H10, but I've never found a need for that because I can do everything with just a, my normal leak detector and some big blue. Works fine. Alright, so I'm going to get a power head for this. Okay, so this is going to be tricky. This unit doesn't have a receiver with a valve on it for me to pump it down. So I'm actually holding back my pressure at that solenoid valve right there. Okay, this is not, I do, this is a, a quick fix. You gotta be careful about this. I usually don't trust a valve, solenoid valve as my pump down method, but I have no other choice. I mean, I could recover the gas, but it just seems a little excessive for this. So what I did was I pumped it down to about 10 PSI. When I say I pumped it down, turned off the temperature controller. There's a solenoid in each coil. Both solenoid valves shut down. The pressures in the system dropped. 
I let the suction side drop to about 10 PSI, then I shut the system off. It slowly rose to 21. Shut it off, and then now I'm gonna bust that power head off while it still has a little bit of pressure. Okay, so I changed this valve, power head I should say, and like I said, I shut it down at the solenoid valves, and this is only an emergency repair because when I come out and change these coils, I'm gonna recover the gas, dispose of it, put new refrigerant in there, change the dryer. Today, this is just a quick fix, and in no way do I suggest doing what I'm doing right now permanently, but I'm not even gonna change the dryer today. And what I did, like I said, I pumped it down at those valves, lowered the pressure in the system down to about 15 PSI, pulled the power head off while uh, pressure was you know, still in there, and it dropped the pressures. And if you look at this thing, it was still off gassing. So now that I put the power head back on, my pressures are increasing because the refrigerant's still boiling out of the oil in the compressor. Okay, so this is just proof of what off-gassing is, that, that oil is just releasing that refrigerant. So the way that I did this, I in no way introduced air or moisture into the system because it was still under pressure. Even though my pressures technically uh, came down, it was still off-gassing refrigerant enough to displace any air from getting into that system okay and again this is only a temporary fix normally i would have had it gone uh, recovered the gas changed the whole txv but just look at this thing i mean it's completely corroded there's no point in trying to weld on that txv it's trash and even the copper it's going to weld too is really pitted out so this is a uh a temporary fix and you know this is this is as good as we can get for now this got this operational I know I'm gonna get some flack for this but this is just how it works sometimes in refrigeration sometimes you don't have time or the ability to recover all the gas especially if you're dealing with some big things you know you just pump it down uh, normally I would say pull a vacuum on it um, I kind of can't pull a vacuum on this system though because these things never seal correctly and uh, I would uh, be afraid of pulling refrigerant right through that solenoid valve. Uh, I don't ever trust a solenoid valve as a pump down method. Now just for changing a mechanical power head, yes, but if I was gonna braze, I would not trust that valve to shut off the refrigerant. You're just asking for a headache. Like I said, because it was a mechanical replacement, I could do this, just pump it down at the solenoid. Okay, so I was able to get it all back together and uh, somewhat cleaned off, nothing, didn't get in there and scrub, just kind of rinse stuff off. So it's gonna operate temporarily until we can get them some new coils. I'm gonna put the drawers back in. About 80 degrees in here. Refrigerant pressures look half ass decent. Uh, I also took a temperature of the outlet air coming out of each coil to compare to make sure that they're blow blowing the same temperature. It's a way to check an expansion valve to see if it's under or overfeeding. And we're good for now. So. One thing I failed to mention here is why there's a temperature controller right here. I'm a big OEM part person. I like putting the factory parts back in because it was designed that way. What we had to do on this particular box was this condensing unit used to control the cold rail and it used to control the base section. It doesn't anymore. They have, uh, this location is located out in the desert and the kitchen gets so hot that the cold rail falls off the map when it gets above 80 in here. So what we had to do was remote the cold rail. So if you look at this carefully, we've got refrigeration lines exiting the back of the box over there. Coming out back behind here. Going up to the roof. So that temperature controller is actually just for the cold rail. And the cold rail is now independent from the bottom section. So that's why this temperature controller is right there. The factory control on the bottom section is a constant cut-in temperature controller like I've talked about before. So that's self-defrosting. I'm a big fan of leaving that control in here instead of putting just a standard Ronco temp control. So this Ronco control is only controlling the top now. 
okay so we could do a little recap we had a service call on some prep table drawers not working uh, when I arrived I found that uh, they were not working uh, the box was about 50 degrees um, the evaporator fan motors were running and the compressor was running um, but I noticed that the condenser fan motor was not discharging very uh, warm air so it wasn't rejecting very much heat I kind of already knew that it was probably low on refrigerant and I was able to confirm that um, found that the unit was severely low on refrigerant so I went ahead and added refrigerant to get the unit operational then once I got it to about where I needed it to be um, I went ahead and shut everything off and then did a leak check on the system. Uh, found uh, multiple leaks in both evaporator coils, but one major leak on the left side evaporator coil at the power head on the TXV. Went ahead and did what I call a hot swap on the power head, replaced it while it was still under pressure. I just pumped it down really low, swapped the power head the whole time while there was still pressure in the system. This is just a temporary fix. Uh, but because I'm going to be coming back changing both those evaporator coils and replacing the refrigerant, I didn't change the dryer. I found no need to vacuum the system down again because I did it all under pressure. So the system never ran out of refrigerant. So it was always pushing any moisture and air out of the system. So it wasn't able to get into the system. Got the unit operational and uh, went ahead and uh, watched it come down to temp. Everything else was good. So again, I used some shortcuts and... Um, you know, there's a time and place for those. Uh, this is the situation where I felt the need. Uh, the perfect solution would have been to tell the customer to shut the box off until I could get back out and replace the coils. But I realized that's going to be about a week or so before I get this quote approved, maybe two weeks. So I had to do something to get them operational. And the leak was so big that I couldn't leave it. You guys saw it was pissing gas out everywhere. So Sometimes, uh, you know, in restaurants and commercial refrigeration, you gotta, you gotta get things going. You know, customers sometimes can't wait for parts to be ordered and sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, you have to be able to own up to those shortcuts and those uh, things that you do. You better make sure that it works. You better make sure that the customer agrees that you're doing a temporary fix. You know, I've done temporary fixes and then the customer says, why didn't you give me the option? I would have said no. You know, so you always got to keep the customer involved, let them know what's going on and, you know, look out for their best interests. So uh, anyways, the unit's operational. Uh, I'm going to submit a quote to replace both those evaporator coils. I'm also going to replace the low pressure control because I don't like the way that it's uh, working. So we'll replace the low pressure control and we'll get them uh, back up and running once they approve it. And that's it. All right.